for inviting me here today. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I enjoy sharing what I know. Um, I started off as just a doggone tourist and by the end of this uh, and my tour over there, I had uncovered things that just were absolutely astounding. Today, when I opened up the, uh, the, uh, the presentation, I, um, I, I found yet another revelation. It seems every time I open the presentation to do a, a refresh of it, I find some other golden nugget. So, so you guys are um, gonna be the beneficiaries of uh, some new information about an old battle itself. So as Brian has said, let's get this rolling here. Um, this is a very significant battle. Uh, Americans, American writers, American press talk about Western battles. We know an awful lot about what happened with the Allies. We really don't know about battles or other conflicts that didn't involve Americans for the most part. In terms of its casualties themselves, if you wanna to try to measure it that way, it was larger than the, um, the Slovak national uprising uh, by 30,000 uh, soldiers as well. But nobody hears about it. It's also the hinterland. It happens also in the hinterland, if you will, of Slovakia. If you take a look at a map and you look over here to the northeast corner uh, where we have uh, Bratislava down here on the left, Barrio is up here, and then around Svidnik, if you've, if you've heard of it, uh, is where the Dukla Pass is here. Now, I became interested in this because right in this corner right here, where, where it borders with Ukraine to the right and north of there is Poland, uh, is where my grandparents came from, actually. And it, it was only maybe 40 kilometers away. And I'm, as I'm preparing for my trip, and I knew this was going to be into a land of the unknown um, at the time when I went over there was the year 2000. Um, and there wasn't a lot of information available. I said, I need to learn everything I need that I can while I'm there. And so one of the things I put on my to-do list was, was to look at Dukla. As I started digging into it, I just became more and more astounded as to what it was all about. So if you remember your history or not, originally Czechoslovakia was broken up in terms in, in 1939 in the Vienna Agreement into three pieces. There was the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, which is now today known as the Czech Republic. There's Slovakia, and then there was what? what uh, we still call Subcarpathian Rus, which is now a part of Ukraine itself. And if you'll notice, if you've ever, if you may not have seen this before, this is one of these maps that shows where the, the Carpathian Rusans live. The grade area uh, shows for the most part where uh, um, they live themselves. Krasno to the north is very important in Poland because it was a, it's a major oil field and it still is. And so if you're a military general, you need to fuel your, your troops uh, and their machinery there. So there's several passes along the Carpathia. And the Carpathia Mountains actually, our borders follow it. And it actually just keeps extending down then through Subcarpathia route into Romania. And so you have this nice um, arch that goes from about mid Slovakia it's not jagged dramatic mountains like uh, the Tatras are at all. It's rolling hills. Uh, almost all of them are wooded. They've been farmed for, law, for lumber for, for thousands of, not thousands, for hundreds of years. But it's had a lot of significant importance too as a pass. And the importance was mostly that it was two things, a major trading north route north-south and it was also a major avenue in which troops would flow. In 1849, Hungary uh, uh, fought uh, in its war of independence uh, against Russia. And 
that was the first time they really saw troops through there. And there wasn't any fighting really through there, but an awful lot of soldiers, an awful lot of cannons rolled through there. The next thing that happened was in World War I. Again, they were fighting. Remember, at, at the time, our Czechoslovakia was actually, well, it was dominated and ruled by Hungary. It was a part of Hungary. There was no such thing as Slovakia or Czechoslovakia at the point here. So again, when the Russians and, and the Kingdom of Hungary uh, uh, battled, uh, there was fighting that went on back and forth through there. Again, another fairly big battle that most people don't hear about. The one I'm most interested in is World War II. Uh, that's where it leaves its biggest footprint, not just not just on, um, on on the history book itself, but on the lands, and you'll see pictures relating to that. In 1938-39, after the Vienna uh, Agreement, and they partitioned off the Bohemia and Moravia up here, we were left with Slovakia, which unfortunately became an Axis state. It became allied with um, with Nazi Germany. In the process, Hungary was anxious to whittle away and get back more property that they felt was rightfully theirs. So what you see down here in, in blue and up here into Uthrod and Transcarpathia, they grabbed that too and they also grabbed the Transylvania area as well. So what it did was it, it just kept shrinking things away. Now, Keep in mind here that we're only kilometers, if you look at the red arrow up here, from where Dukla is right here. And now uh, my grandparents, interestingly, were in, not in Slovakia during the war. My grandparents' family, they had immigrated before them, but they were actually in Hungary. And Hungary being allied to Rose, Rose troops. So Slovakia had an army that was under Axis control, and so did Hungary. And they went lockstep in with Germany, kicking and screaming, if you will. Now to set the stage here, when, when, um, the, when the Czech lands were, um, were taken over, it was very clear to the locals that eventually the pincers was going to close and they would be invaded by Nazis too. An awful lot of them said, heck no, we won't go. And they fled. They fled over to what they thought at the time was a good bet, Poland. What we saw was an awful lot of people that had been recruited into the, uh, the Slovak army deserted. And they just ran across the Carpathians uh, and up into Warsaw to create um, a, what they called a legion. It was a force. They tried to build themselves a force of power there um, as a private army, if you will. It also consisted of political refugees and, and Jews as well. So everybody's trying to get out of anything that's within the German field of influence here. Another interesting thing is that back in the 1850s, there had been a migration from the Czech lands into Valihinen, which is actually in Russia. The people at the time had been told this is the land of milk and honey, let's go. So there's actually a very significant Czech population um, in that area at this point in time and had been for, for almost 70 years. And those are important because these people are, even though they are, they are now Russian citizens, they are still very pro. Um, Czechoslovakia. What happened with the Legion then was all these all these people bailed out of Slovakia and out of Subcarpathian Rus, which is where most of them came from for the most part, uh, because people in the Czech land got trapped uh, and couldn't get out. It happened so fast uh, that they they had accumulated thousands of them, and 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 their leader went to the president of Poland and said, hey, you know, um, you know, we got an army here 
and uh, we're on your side. And the president said, you know what? We're not really comfortable with you guys having your own army in our country. And so thanks, but no thanks. So 3,000 of our people actually left at that point and went and joined the French Foreign Legion. So if in the course of your history, you come across Czechs or Slovaks or Rusins uh, that fought in the French Foreign Legion, that's a large part of what happened to them, as well as other people that, that snuck there from Bardia, or from uh, Bratislava. However, 700 of them said they were going to stay and fight. What they didn't realize was that in a few months that Poland was going to in, be invaded by Germany. It wasn't just Mo Bohemia and Moravia that was going to be uh, uh, taken. The way the Germans invaded Poland, I hate to say this, involved Slovak troops. And it's worth noting this here because um, we like to think that, well, maybe Slovakia just sat back and was quiet. One of the things that really bugged me and I wanted to learn about, and there wasn't a lot written about, is what did people do during the war? What did they do when they were, they were under Axis control? You know, did, did they just sit there and take it? Did, you know, go, they go in the woods and hide? Turns out there's a lot of things going on in Slovakia at the time. Um, Germany came in and they brought German troops into Slovakia and they also said, hey, you, the Slovak army, none of whom wanted to be in the army, mind you, were all invading Poland. So they took part and they went through the Carpathian Mountains and supported the uh, actions of the, uh, uh, of the invading troops here. Having done that, an awful lot, as that was going on, there was an awful lot of army deserters, even more than there had been, who just fled. And they said, we're going to Russia. It's gonna be safe if we go there. And the Subcarpathian Rus territory people weren't very happy about it either. So they all fled to Russia. Um, again, it was deserters, it was Jews, it was people that wanted to be partisans. And as soon as they got there, they got arrested. Um, even though they said, hey, you know, we're here, we're on your side, we want to fight with you. And they were like, no, we don't think so. You guys might be spies. Um, and if nothing else, you're traitors by fleeing from your own country. So we're going to send you to the Gulag. And they sent thousands and thousands of Czechs, Slovaks, and Rusins to the Gulag after that, the invasion there. Now, over the next couple of years, Germany started moving troops. Let me change, and I'm going to use a, a highlighter here. And it started penetrating through Poland. And they were they were going to go from here. That's not a mark that I want. I wanted a pen. So, so Germany's here, and we're going to. It's not drawing for whatever reason. So we'll just go back to the laser pointer. So Germany is is pushing um, into Poland, and at the at the initial takeover of Poland, there was a Soviet German. Uh, non-aggression pact at that time and the Soviets participated in that and so what ended up happening was Poland got split in two here where the Soviets took half to the east and the Germans took half to the west. Little did they know that that would last less than a year and that and that it was it was the Nazis intent to push through and take over the Soviet Union as well. And that's when the war was declared and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed until they almost got to Moscow. So they were well past the Black Sea as well, inland here. And the, so the Germans had taken over all this, 
For the most part, the Slovak troops remained in place. They did not follow this across. However, the thing that happened in 1942, as this invasion of Germany into Russia was going on, was the Soviets had second thoughts about all of these Slovaks and Rusins and, and Czechs and said, you know, well, maybe, seeing as how we have some trusted soldiers um, or officers that had come over from Slovakia, uh, and one of the guy's names in particular was Ludwig Zvoboda, who was, who was a, a very influential officer, uh, even in the first war, uh, he had accomplished a lot. And they said, why don't we let Zvoboda uh, rise up an army here? And uh, we'll call it the first Czechoslovak independent field battalion. And they released the people that were in the gulag that they had initially arrested and sent them down here um, far in, deep into the Soviet Union to organize and be provided with a lot of Russian support here. And once they were supported and once they started started, they teamed up with the 38th Army of, the, of Slovakia. So we're setting the stage here for, for this troop to rise into the tens of thousands here of people. It wasn't just small little uh, bandits running around, but it was a very substantial army with tanks and artillery and, and even its own um, air force as well. And they were important in, there was a battle in Kharkov and there was a, ba a very large battle in, in Kiev where they actually lost a lot of people. And so that's our people that are fighting with the Soviets to get back. Now the Soviets deal was they're trying to move east to west, get across, all right? That sets the stage for then what actually happens here. Wait, this is, these are some pictures of this ultra secret location called Bazukluk in Russia, which is where the first Czechoslovak army uh, actually organized, trained, uh, and were equipped and, um, and, and headed out from. This was far enough inland that it never got, it never got overtaken by the Germans. The Germans actually never got that far. The Germans got about mm, this far across here. And you can say, Bucklock is probably around here. Um, let's say, just for sake of argument here, which is probably a thousand miles away from their homeland here. Um, Germany had gotten this far. The Hungarian army was part of it as well. And so they had to go and fight with them. As the war turned around in 43 and 44, the Germans said, it's time for us to start building defensive preparations. So what these blue lines here indicate are these things, they called them defensive lines. And they, they were actually, and are still there today. Uh, there are all sorts of defensive um, material that's been put up in terms of stopping the troops and, and inhibiting uh, bunkers, or inhibiting tanks and creating bunkers. And, and so this is where this line was built. There was a first line that was built in 1940 called the Arpad line. And then it got further, then it, it actually got fortified and created a second line within it called St. Laszlo. And then the third line was called the Hyundai line built in 1944. So that while the Nazis were still occupying all this land, they knew that the Russians were coming back. Now, how did these walls get built and, and fortifications get built? Well, they got built by your relatives and mine. Um, the, the local citizens were pretty much conscripted to go and build these things. And there was a lot of concrete forms that were built, a lot of uh, mines that were laid. These were all done by citizens. If you go wander around the woods today, there's not like any signs to these things, but they're there. They're all over by the thousands. 
you'll find bunkers. This is what it looks like today. Buried in the hills, uh, under the ground here, there was troop trenches. You'll, this stuff never got corrected in any ways. Nobody had the money or the time and they, they just, it was in the woods, so why worry about it? So you can go wandering around in the woods, and I have, and you just find these things and they're all over the place. And this was part of what they believed was gonna help them defend um, the Axis powers themselves. You'll also see these other things called dragon's teeth. They're basically concrete, um, steel reinforced concrete uh, forms that are meant to stop tanks from coming over. And if it can't stop them, it's exposed their underbellies, which are the weak part, and you can hopefully wipe out the tank that way. You can walk along, and these are my pictures here. You know, this is a missile crater, you know, probably uh, from, from one of their artilleries. Uh, there's more trenches everywhere. You just have to stop for a minute and look, and then you'll find these teeth all over the place. They're still there. So now their original plan, because we now had the first Czechoslovak army working right with the Russians here, was they were gonna bypass Carpathians altogether. They were like, why do we wanna go through mountains? That's a lot of work. And every time you go through the mountains, you know that the, the defender has the advantage. So what we really wanna do is we're just gonna keep going through Poland and we're gonna to go to Germany and we're gonna take down uh, Munich and Berlin. And that was their plan. And that was the way it was gonna go. The Slovak army was still hanging out in here, uh, defending these lines. Uh, some Nazi troops were up front here, but not very many of them at this point. It, it actually, during this period of time, was kind of a sleepy time. Uh, in 1941, there had been some major deportation of Jews, but that stopped after about nine months, and there were still about 40% of the Jews in this whole region remaining. Uh, and they said, uh, we'll just leave them. We'll just leave them. However, Hitler still wasn't feeling good about the Slovak army. He didn't trust them at all. He just had this into premonition about it. So while it was quiet and there wasn't any fighting that went on here, there hadn't been any fighting at all up until the Russian offensive back towards. So it was quiet. There was military running around. Uh, you know, all the men were gone, obviously, in the army. But for the most part, there wasn't much of anything going on. And if you know this area, as I do, you know, it's what we call the sticks. You know, there isn't a lot there. There's not a lot of strategic value there uh, as well, either. So it was looked at as an afterthought. And this is the way they were going to go until they got a phone call. So this is the fella, uh, Konev, who is in charge of that whole front that goes all the way from Romania all the way up to Lithuania. He was in charge of 1.2 million troops. This is a Russian general. Uh, it was called the Fourth Ukrainian Front. And there was actually three fronts. Each of them consisted of uh, approximately 1 million troops. So you've got about four to five million troops coming at Nazi Germany, all right? This guy was very brilliant. He was uh, very, you know, very highly meddled, uh, had uh, been victorious over some major battles uh, during World War II already. The Battle of Kursk uh, was, was a huge one as well that he was victorious over. Uh, down below him was a, a general who actually focused on the region that we're talking about today. Moskalenko uh, was a commander. He started off in an anti-tank brigade and he ended up becoming commander of two different armies and an army um, uh, is roughly 500,000 troops. So he was a big cheese. Now this 38th army was, um, was the group that had the first Czechoslovak army attached to it. This is the fellow we talked about, uh, Ludwig Svoboda here. He had been fighting with Russia 
uh, he had, he had, he and um, the Russians went back a long ways, but he was very much a pro Czechoslovak person, but he was also a very pro communist uh, fella as well. Interestingly, as this battle is coming through by Dupla Pass and the Carpathian Mountains, 60% of the troops that were called into battle there were Carpatho Rusins uh, that came from that first Czechoslovak army. What we found is as the battle went more from the east to the west, that you, as you liberated lands, you started picking up more soldiers. So as they got into the more Slovak speaking areas, the Slovaks would jump into the army. And then as you got into the Czech region, the Czechs would, would jump on as well. And so it got to be huge. It got to be very large, you'll see at the end. But he came into this battle with 12,000 troops. Right? But all of these were just passionate people that wanted to be there. The, so, so what happens is that Moskalenko and, and Konev get this phone call that says, hey, you guys, you know, there's this thing called the uh, Slovak National Uprising that's kind of rumbling and coming to a head pretty quickly. I think maybe you guys should come in and try to help them out a little bit here. Uh, and they said, okay, uh, when do you need us? And they were like, three days. <laughs> And here you are sitting there with a half a million troops. And now all of a sudden you were planning on going east to west. And now somehow you got to get down here where the national uprising is in Banska Bistricio. Um, okay. While this is going on, through all this assault that was going on beforehand, the Soviets had been sending in communist um, um, fighters to organize the uh, resistance troops that were mostly scattered throughout all of Hungary and Slovakia, hiding in the woods, but not well coordinated. The only, the only resistance that was getting well coordinated was up near where the, where the, uh, um, where, where the, where the uprising was going to take place. And that was easier to do. In this case, what they would do is, is they would, they would drop in uh, Soviet soldiers, maybe three or four of them, and organize a troop and radio back and ask for drops of ammunition and weapons and food and things like that. So they're all pockmarked it all over the place around here. They also got in touch with uh, some dissidents that were inside the Slovak army. Now this is ostensibly allegiant to the country of Slovakia, which is an Axis country. But none of them want to be involved with fighting the Russians. The, as far as they were concerned, the Russians were their friends. The Rus Russians had done good things for them in the past. They didn't want to fight them. So they'd set up this, as part of this national uprising, they said, all right, we're going to let the partisan activity go here. What can we get in and how fast can we do it? Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make some of our troops turn left and come down through the Carpathians. We're going to order the Slovak army to commit mutiny and basically come up behind the Germans and other Axis powers that are fighting behind these lines here and knock them out. So we'll knock them out from the front, knock them out from the back, uh, pincer movement. And then within three days, we can then just blast our way down to the uprising, they can hold out for about three days. That was the plan. That's originally what they thought the plan would be. You know, half a million people, that shouldn't be such a big deal um, at all. We got 32,000 behind here and we've got all sorts of people in the woods that can disrupt railroad lines and stuff like that. And even as part of this uprising, they had, it was actually their first Czechoslovak army had a, um, or not the army itself, but they actually had an Air Force division um, that, that actually had created a base somewhere between Poprad and Spiska Nova Vez down here. In the woods, they created an air base. And it was the first Czechoslovak army airborne troops 
that were coming in and dropping off all sorts of things, including tanks and artillery, a lot of big heavy duty equipment and providing it to the resistance, uh, mostly over to the West in here. Now you say, oh, come on, how can you do that? You have to remember, this was 1942. There was no such things as, as satellite observation. Um, you know, there was no such thing as the internet. Telephones didn't work. It was pretty easy to hide a lot of stuff in plain sight when you're covering such large territories as well. You'd never get away with that today. But they were able to do that today. So this was the plan. The plan was, well, you know, one, two punch, knock them through and we'll go, go through, all right? So, and by day three, I should have skipped, but that's essentially saying the same thing uh, here is, is after they hook up on day three, then they move down to the troops here and they all go together. The other personality that's worth mentioning is Gottfried, um, Gotthard Henrique, who was the commander in chief of uh, the first Panzer Army and, and the first Hungarian Army as well. His, he came from a family of soldiers. He was just known as a master of defensive tactics. And later on, uh, after this battle, he was assigned to the defense of Berlin. Uh, that's how well he was regarded and a high, an officer. So now you've got this big Czechoslovak and Russian um, attack on one side, and you've got this guy with an awful lot of troops on the other side here. And they're all sitting there positioned in front of our little pass, okay? <laughs> that nobody's ever heard of before, all right? During the summer, as this was happening, the Slovak troop, which had army that had been over here, uh, moved over to Eastern Slovakia so they could kind of be away from the insurrection and not be called in to fight against the SNP itself. Okay. At this point, we, remember we talked about Hitler not really trusting the, the Slovakia army itself. And, uh, so, so he's like, you know, I'm not sure that I really go for this. And he says, and we know that there's gonna be an uprising in Slovakia. So tell you what, you guys, get your armies to go down there into Slovakia and basically take the whole Slovak army prisoner, take their weapons away from them and imprison them, all right? They were to do nothing. So the Nazis came in through Poland, which through the Dukla Pass, which it had owned at the time, and, and tied their hands, all right? All of this while the SNP is still planning on going on over in the east. So now we've got a, an army that's totally useless. Um, and Hitler brings in tens, I think it was hundreds of thousands of, of uh, SS troops. So he had his most vicious soldiers brought in to actually defend these lines in the Carpathian Mountains in Slovakia. All right. Obviously, the people that lived there weren't stupid. They were all bailing out getting out of town as quickly as they could. Uh, there wasn't much they could do um, other than run and hide, frankly. And there wasn't any place to hide other than the woods. So they spent most of the war, or not most of the battle time, not just the war, uh, in the woods themselves here. So here's how the initial assault came down. What happened was that Konev and Moskalenko's troops weren't quite ready to go. Some, uh, some, some resist, one of the resistant groups in the SNP got, and, and they believe it was somebody that was, uh, that a group that was being led by uh, a Soviet paratrooper that came in, jumped the gun and started fighting, even though Russia wasn't ready for this. They needed two more days to get ready for this. And the fighting started and the commanders of the SMP were like, well, we can't call them back now. So we're just going to have to do our best. We started attacking right away. We being the Russians. At the same time, 
down here, and even at, you wonder how the SNP actually happened in terms of how did the, the German troops come in? Well, they all didn't come in from Germany to go after them. There were a lot of them down in Hungary. And so they brought up an awful lot of uh, SS soldiers that had been stationed in Hungary, both to put down the SNP and to defend uh, the Dukla Pass and the Arpad line itself here. We had not, we being the Soviets and, and Czechoslovakia had been unaware that Slovakia army in the East had been disarmed. We had no idea that it happened. So we were going along with the plan that we were gonna get, you know, they were gonna meet up with us so that we were gonna have, a, you know, equal uh, powers on both sides and um, it'll be easier for both of us. After the first, as the first troops moved in, they came down from Poland uh, and they didn't have any resistance. Uh, one of the problems that happened was it started raining at this point and the Czechoslovak army ended up being directed into some swampy area someplace. And it took them two days to get back on track and get back towards Dukla. Um, and then they, they bogged down at the village called Dukla, which is in Poland just a few kilometers north of the pass itself. And that's where, remember I said, I showed you where they had all those, uh, those lines of defense put in there. That's where they had stopped. One of the things that uh, Moskalenko did not like was that uh, Zvoboda always liked to be in the middle of the battle itself. So here's this big shot general running around and um, He's right there where things are at. But that was what made him so good, was he was with his troops and he knew what was going on every instant along the way. So now, if you'll notice, a week has gone by here and they're stalled, okay? It, nobody's making progress either way here. They don't, the USSR doesn't know that we don't have an army coming to help. And, and at this point, the SMP is in progress. And the SNP has been told to expect the Soviet and Czechoslovak army to meet up with them by now, which they hadn't. There's, there's always going to be a controversy, it seems, in every battle. The controversy here was that Stalin really didn't want uh, the SNP to succeed. That, this is the theory, and I disagree with it. But, but this is the theory, that he, he particularly stalled out because he wanted to see all the Slovaks fall, um, uh, slaughtered. He wanted to have a communist regime in power as a buffer between Russia and the, West of, and the rest of the West so that this won't happen again. So he wanted a controlled country there. He did not want Slovak nationals, Czech nationals, um, Ukrainian nationals, to try to go create their own country. And that part was well known. Now, I don't believe that that was a legitimate argument, and I don't believe that's what he was thinking. As evil and a fella as, as, uh, as he was, uh, I don't think he was doing that purposely so. When Hindler heard about the SNP, what he did, let's call it, um, this, when Himmler heard about the SNP, that's when he brought in uh, the hundreds of thousands of troops themselves, disarmed them, and basically told Slovakia as a government to go to, you know, you know, just go take a hike and we're taking over your country. So they invaded Slovakia about that point, brought the army in to fight directly with them. Um, on the 10th, the Russians reinforced their fighting. They brought in tanks. The Russians brought in almost a thousand tanks to this battle. And the Germans brought in 500 tanks. Now, there are some pretty big battle, tank battles, like Kursk. And this is about half the size of the Kursk battle here. Yeah. 
It got to be tough. This was happening in late September into October. It started snowing through there. This was one of the women that lived through it here. Uh, the Germans were occupying her village at the time. She didn't know anything. They didn't tell her anything. And uh, eventually she ended up, you know, running and hiding away. This slide is out of order. So excuse me on this one. We'll move along through this. So now they're still battling that Dukla Pass. But Moskalenko is saying, you know, we're not getting anywhere here. They're all up in the hills. They got snipers all over the place. They got tanks pointing down at us. We can't make any progress. We're getting slaughtered. As it was, the, the Slovak Ar Czechoslovak army lost 60% of their, of their fighters uh, in this battle alone. So they started poking at different parts of the border. And the first village that was actually liberated in Czechoslovakia was Kalinov. It was a mountainous village to the east of Dukla by about eight kilometers or so. Just a small little uh, village, but it was pretty, it was pretty uh, um, dramatic, uh, a, uh, a liberation. And it was largely because it was the first time that any army had ever tried to drive a tank over the top of a mountain ridge. And so when the Nazis were expecting them to come, and they came down, roaring down the hill with tanks, it wasn't expected. The defenses weren't set up for that. And um, we were able to quickly grab that village, but that didn't help us much. It was more of a ceremonial, more of a um, something to, to encourage um, the morale of the people itself. The battle just kept getting worse though. They kept not being able to get through. Now remember, we, you know, the promise was we're going to get down there in three days, okay? And so here it is, we're in the middle, we're like two weeks later here, and it just starts pouring, just starts pouring. Now remember back then, things weren't as sophisticated as they were now. An awful lot of troops had horse-drawn uh, artillery, um, an awful lot of ammunition um, is being brought in by mule, believe it or not. And this is in the 1940s. On both sides, you would see that. So what happens here is Dukla is up here. So I'm going to really enlarge this whole thing. And I'm sure some of you have, have been in these regions. Let me sort of orient you. This is Poland up here. This is the Carpathian Mountains all through here. Spidnik is here. Way down to the left corner is Preshov. Uh, that kind of gets you to where we're talking here. The first thing that they tried to do for an awful long time was to get through the Dukla Pass here from October 6th to the 8th. And they actually kind of got their toe into Vishni Komarik, but they really couldn't make any progress. They got that far, but because of the cliffs and ridges, they still, you know, even though they were through that pass, technically, they really couldn't make any progress. It was just a trickle of people that could get through. So they said, you know what, that if we can't penetrate through here, let's find another way into the country. So they went over here to the le left and on October 10th, they actually tried to penetrate with tanks and artillery, Vepanik and um, another town down here, which is a little off the map. I'm not sure the name of it here as a way of getting down because they were still thinking that the Slovak army was going to beat them at that point. And they couldn't make any progress here. So they backed up and then they tried going down another valley. Now, remember in the Carpathian mountains, um, they're kind of built that like, imagine if you spread out your fingers like this and kind of drew from the top of the ridge of the mountain down, there's these you know, little brooks that would come down through and each brook had a village in it. That's the way our villages were settled back then, um, along brooks and streams. And so these were the little fingers. So here is another path that they could try to get down through here um, on, um, on the tent that did not work. They tried to get down to through uh, Vizhny Pisana, 
in on October 19th here, and they started a pretty good battle here and made progress. At the same time, another line came down through Svidnica and Kuzlova, and this whole area here, just north of Spidnik, from Vladimirova, Kapisova, Doposlava, Nizna Pisano, was the site of an enormous tank battle. It went on for three straight days. And it was just tank after tank after tank. It was one of, one of these tank textbook stories. And there was just so much carnage all over the place. This was one of those artillery battles at that point. And they won it. And they broke through it. And this was how they actually got into the country. When you go out to these lands today, if you ever go to choose to visit, there's, there's a museum, and it's in Spidnik, up about this battle itself here. There's an awful lot of what one might call war memorials there. And all of it is leftover stuff from the battle. Now it's been cleaned up, it's been put on concrete foundations, but it is everywhere you go. Um, this is the area that they call the Valley of Death, the tank, that whole tank area from Vladimirova North from there. Um, 28 tanks were totally destroyed but at this point, once they'd lost that battle, the Germans retreated. There was no fighting anymore. And then they were able to move fast and move forward. This here is when you go from Svidnik into, into the Valley of Death, you see this as you enter the area. And it's showing basically a, a Soviet tank crushing a German tank. These are very much common uh, sites that you'll see along there. Um, tanks all over the place in there. It just, when I went in there and I was fortunate enough, to, I had met my cousins over there. I didn't know them, but they were happy to follow me around Slovakia for, for two weeks. And uh, uh, we lived and breathed uh, their lives. We went to all these places. And there was one place where I went up to see an airplane that was up on a hill. And we, we ran through this field, but it looked much like this here, to see the airplane that's up there. And it's a Soviet airplane. And, and we looked at each other and we got up there and said, you know, that probably wasn't such a smart idea. We probably should have stayed on the roads because there are still mines exploding up there. You still hear a story not so much about people, but animals. You hear about a cow, you know, losing it up there. My uh, cousin's uh, mother told me an exciting story about last month. They had a, uh, uh, they had some artillery shells that were live that washed up from the creek in her backyard. So while after the war, the POWs, the Germans, uh, were forced uh, to defuse these mines, and they lost several dozen POWs in the process. They got a lot of them, but there's a lot still there, and they're still moving around in the ground. Uh, and that's, you know, it's a beautiful land, but it's just, it's just a shame to see this sort of thing here. Um, I never would have expected this at all. So he retreated, Henrique retreated 200 kilometers to the west. The Russians took 31,000 Germans. Svidnik, the town of Svidnik is kind of a, uh, let's call it a 30,000, 20, 30,000 uh, size town, was virtually totally destroyed. A lot of our churches, as you saw in the first picture, uh, were damaged. Interestingly, for the most part, churches never got damaged. Uh, and most of the time, houses out there did not get damaged uh, by the troops. What happened was all these artillery shells that were flying overhead would emit sparks and cinders, and they would fall on these wooden houses. 
and many of them still had straw thatch for roofs and they would just they would just go up like a matchstick from there after this battle as they started liberating slovakia uh, they they had over 9,000 more volunteers just pick up. And that included a lot of the defectors from the army itself. Just to kind of remind you here, the SNP began on the 6th, which was two days earlier than they wanted it to. We promised that we would be down there to meet them three days later, four days later. Uh, but it actually took us to October 28th. It took us almost two months to get down there. This is where the argument comes. It's like, well, you guys weren't even trying to get there. You just wanted, you just wanted all the SNP fighters to be slaughtered. And I would argue the fact that the USSR took over 100,000 casualties themselves, that they weren't just doing this to ignore them. I mean, these are valuable troops that they need to fight. I don't think they would purposely uh, send them to slaughter. Although some people may think that's, that was Stalin's modus operandi. And then from there, actually, the Czechoslovak army went on and they, they went further. They, I talked with one of the soldiers uh, from there uh, before he passed away. And he told, I said, what towns did you go through? And he says, I have no idea. And I said, why not? He says, we moved so fast from village to village that we never really got a chance to even figure out where we were. Uh, so they made really good progress. Uh, and their goal was to get all the way to Prague, which they did. And they fought in the final uh, battle uh, to liberate Prague itself. That's Anna here. Um, this is a this is what some of the houses look like. This is not war damage, but this is what some of the area looks like. A, a lot of people never came back. Um, and uh, as communism took hold, a lot of the people just left right after the war. And a lot of the houses out there, especially when you go as far away as my villages are, just when somebody dies, the house just kind of collapses a few years later because nobody wants to live there. All the kids are like, hey, we're getting out of here. We're going to the cities. And then they couldn't wait until uh, we became a part of the European Union, because then they could move to any other country and get an even better job. So because of that, all of this stuff got neglected. And it's, it's like a time warp some, in some respects going back there. There's few people, few people at all. And there's just some pictures of what it looked like back then. And it was like this. A lot of people didn't have houses to live in for two or three years afterwards. Um, my cousin's m grandmother, she built her house with her husband. Uh, they were in their 20s, I think, at the time. She formed with her hands. Uh, they would dig clay out of, out of the uh, side of the hill. And she made 30,000 bricks for their house, handmade bricks. And he built the house over two years. And she showed me her hands and she showed me the bricks. And it was just, these people didn't have any choice. They didn't have any support from it. They had to put Humpty Dumpty to back together again without any help from anybody. It, you know, it wasn't until two years later that, that really a new government came in, the, the um, uh, communist government, and they actually started to make some uh, changes that actually benefited them. Uh, Kind of wrap it up here. Henrique was reassigned uh, for the final battle uh, in the defense of Berlin. So that tells you what they thought about him. Uh, he put up a good fight. If you go there today and you go up to these uh, villages, Nizhny Komarik has a very, very large uh, memorial here to uh, the first Czechoslovak army uh, themselves. Uh, it's big, it's imposing. Um, I'd say I'm about as half, I'm about half as tall as that, that statue of those two people uh, over here on the, on the left-hand side. For a long time, they would have, it was basically a day of celebration for them. It was, I think it was, 
I'm not sure what the day was. I don't know if it was their liberation day or whether it was a day of an event that happened here. But everybody took off from work and school and everybody was required to come here uh, from the region. Uh, and there would be a celebration or not a, a memorial service that would come with speeches for hours. All the students were required to come and dress up and parade uh, as well. Uh, I talked with my cousins who participated in those things as well. Uh, there's a lookout tower that was built. Um, it's nice, but I mean, the whole place is pretty moving. This is, um, this is a memorial that's on a road along the way. It's called the Cracked Heart. And uh, one of the major uh, officers from the Czechoslovak army died here uh, in an automobile accident just two days after the uh, the battle concluded themselves. And so this was a memorial to him. There's in the town itself, there's of, of Svidnik. Uh, this is the military museum they have. There's also a separate museum. Um, I think they've all been taken in under the National Museum now, um, which is the uh, Ruth, which is the Ukrainian Ruthenian Cultural Museum. It's there. And there's a lot of live uh, displays you can sort of see the back of a plane sticking out here there's dozens and dozens of tanks and artillery and stuff hanging around there if you go into the town of Spidnik, this is the russian cemetery uh, nine thousand soldiers are buried here alone there's actually a german cemetery as well and it's kept up by private citizens from germany uh, not a single dime uh, from uh, Slovakia goes into this. In Poland, there are some big monuments too, uh, because the battle to get to uh, to the um, to the oil uh, depots was pretty fierce too. So before they got to Dukla, they had to go through here, and they lost a lot of people there. And the Czechoslovak army fought on the way. There is good news though in all of this, and that's that most of this region now has been declared um, environmentally protected. Uh, there is a reserve that was created in Poland, there's one in Ukraine, and there's one in um, Slovakia itself. You're gonna find uh, things in here like they are still, scientists are still finding, and I was in touch with one a few years ago, just before he we went on a trip. They are still finding hundreds and hundreds of little microbes and little plants and things that had never been identified in the world before. These are totally new to human scientists, and they're being used to create new medicines. Um, and they're doing the best to protect this region now. So, and there's also one small area that has a primeal forest. That means basically uh, it's never been logged before. And so everything that is in the ground is what was always in the ground. It was never disturbed by people at all. And so this is what the lands look like. Uh, some of the villages were, you know, closed. Some of them were burned out, especially in the Operation Vistula area here, obviously. There's no houses, I mean, there's no villages there anymore, unfortunately. Um, but the good news is that uh, all three of these countries were able to cooperate and, and put a, set aside some of this land as well. That's all I have to say. I know I ran a little bit over, sorry. Um, I think we should open it up for questions at this point. That's a link to my website, iabsi.com. It's, I put it together basically about Slovakia uh, research because when I did my research and found my cousins, I found that this formula, this method that I use, and these these tools I used, and these sources of information I used, are applicable all over Slovakia. Uh, so there is a, a a big section in there on uh, genealogy, and it's all free. Everything's about it for free. I said, you know what? I already have a career. I don't need to try to make money off of this. Most people don't make any money off it. Fine. And by the way, there's a whole Dukla and military section in there. So everything I've talked about today is there and more uh, in terms of both writing and pictures. So Brian, do you want to uh, open this up here? Um, 
see what we have for questions. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Um, I guess I'll, uh, in, I guess following your uh, remark about the, uh, the German cemetery, uh, one, someone in the Q&A posted about a German cemetery in the town of Vazetz. I've not heard of that. Do you, where, uh, where is that? Do you know? Uh, it's, let me uh, check the comment again here. Oh, that would be curious to know about. I, I see, see, there's always another golden nugget, but it doesn't yeah, surprise me. I'm 40, sure there's plenty. 40 kilometers yeah. west, no, 40 kilometers east of Poparad. Okay. So, yeah, it's a bit there, there's, I know of another German cemetery uh, from a World War I battle, uh, which was Zaboro, Z-B-O-R-O-V, mm -hmm. um, that has thousands of German soldiers in there too. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't surprise me, they, you know, sometimes the logistics gets in the way of, you know, actually bringing your people home. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so the first question uh, we have from the Q&A, uh, uh, someone asked how wide was the battle area? Because he, uh, he referred to, he said some histories refer to fighting as far away as Yaskika, uh, Cheterzna by Mezla Borza. Um, so I think how the important I... thing to know is that it was a moving front. Okay. It, it, you can't just say it was like the bulldozer is this wide and it went at that speed. A lot of times it would break off into pieces. And we have to remember that there was, even though originally the way they were going to get down into the southern part of Hungary and attack Hungary was they were going to go around the Carpathian Mountains the other way. So we went around to the right, and they were going to go around to the left, to the south, more towards Budapest um, from Ukraine. And um, that part of the army, that was a separate army, a separate action. It just happened to happen coincidentally. It wasn't, it didn't, it was asynchronous. It didn't need to be coordinated between the two. So yeah, there was another, there was another battle at another front. There were there were dozens of fronts and they would just come and go. They would refer to a front organizationally, but then what ended up happening say, and they would basically say, Konev, you're responsible from here to here, <laughs> you know, and uh, you figure out how to do that. So you may have a front that passes through part of your territory, but you may not get another piece of your front through until later eventually they got through and touched almost every town. But for the most part, it was just a walkthrough. Once they got through the Carpathian, um, through that Arpad line, it was pretty much a cakewalk from there because everybody was on the run. So that it wasn't a lot of damage uh, beyond this. There was, of course, a lot of war crimes. It's the thing that nobody wants to talk about, but it's it's there. And there, there were crimes against women. Um, there was crimes against property. There was murders for no particular reason. Um, there were vigilante groups that wanted to get back at one another. And nobody will talk to you about that. Most of the people that lived through that aren't around anymore to talk to because it was an ugly, ugly time. And nobody knows who is responsible. There was, one of the problems with resistance groups is they all, unless you can coordinate them, they all run to their own uh, agendas, if you will. So even though they tr may try to link up with an army and, and flow through, you will find lots of um, um, nationalist movements, for example, the UPA, the Ukrainian nationalist movement with Bandera. Um, that was nuts. That was, he just wanted his own country. I mean, and he was going to do it on his own, basically. Uh, so it's a tangent, but yeah, it was kind of part of the same front, if you will, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the same time. I think it was weeks later. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, the next uh, co or question we have, is there a roster of soldiers of the first Czechoslovak army? available? There is, and I don't think it's online. I believe it's held by the Svidnik Museum. 
and it probably never will be 100% complete. But I do know that it exists. I do know soldiers that were in it that would go to reunions. Almost all of them have passed away at this point. So what you would need to do is, is check with uh, Svidnik, the military museum uh, in Svidnik. I've never seen it though, online. I, it's not posted online, let's put it that way. Okay. So I, um, this comment is, uh, it's referring to, I guess, I, you know, since you've mentioned, I mean, uh, mentioned earlier that there's, I guess, um, there's still an active problem with live munitions in the area. Um, and someone was asking whether they're still recovering the remains of, of the fallen in battle from this time. Are they, are there, are there, you know, are, are, are remains still being uh, discovered to this day? Yeah, honestly, nobody knows where everybody fell. It usually happens at construction sites uh, where things, most of the remains that, that were easy picking, so to speak, easy, obvious, easy to find had been taken uh, properly um, interred. But there was plenty of other people that died in plenty of ugly battles and fell in places that nobody knows about. And they'll still find things. There's, there's go on the internet and go, go to YouTube. There are these kids that run around with metal detectors trying to find stuff um, in battlefields, or places where there were battles during World War II, obscure little places. It's, it's just kind of scary about some of the stuff they, they, they come up with. And it, some of it's even on TV, um, where they find bones, you know, just random bones and stuff, human remains. What do you do with it? First of all, it's illegal. I mean, they weren't supposed to be doing that anyways. The answer is, yeah, they're there. Um, if they took, and a lot of it's probably not that far away. Once the farms were collectivized, uh, at least in the rural area, which is what I'm more familiar with, um, it, it got a lot more focused and there became a lot of land that wasn't tilled anymore. Because usually what happens is in the wintertime, the land heaves and, and flows based on frost and, and, um, and icing conditions and may bring things to the surface. Um, that's not being found anymore. So whatever's there is, is deeper or it's a building was on it. The answer is it could be, a, it, the answer is yes, they're there. And there's nobody to know where. Yeah, yeah uh, I guess, the, uh, I just wanna share a little uh, brief, because uh, I, I visited, the, I went through the area, uh, to do, I went, I drove up to the memorial with my cousins, and on the, on the road back, we, we stopped off the road, because I noticed there was a, there was a plane parked on the hillside, mm -hmm. so we parked the car, we walked up there, and I looked, I was looking at the plane, and the plane looked awful familiar to me, it was, it was like a type that I, I'd seen before, and uh, and then so I was thinking, well, this this looks like a DC three, you know, like a, the a, a popular transport plane from the 30s and 40s. And my cousins were they were like, no, no, that's, that's not a no, I can't be a DC three. And of course, we walk up to, up the hill, and then we see like there's a red star on the it's camouflage green. There's a red star on the right. tail. And then I looked under the engine, and there's like a, there's a brass plate saying "Made in Detroit." <laughs> So when I, I showed it to them, yes, this was an American plane. <laughs> we, sold, we sold a lot of uh, material to, to Russia mm -hmm. during the war. They, they were caught with their pants down too. And they didn't produce stuff fast enough. We built all sorts of stuff for them. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot. I, I know they're, they're reticent to admit that we provided a lot of material support in a lot of areas so but yeah that was a and uh you know i'm okay with that because they took the brunt of of the deaths yeah if you really look at it and you look at the millions of people that died i don't think we could have won this war without them whoops sorry 
So, yeah. But the problem was the, the Cold War just put this brick wall of information up between both sides. So we never could share. And the story is, you know, always written by the, uh, the victor. And especially in Slovakia, Czechoslovakia, they were trying to create a model communist state. And by doing that, they were essentially telling people to forget about the past. We will tell you what you need to know, what you need to learn, um, what you need to wear. And they left out all that whole side of it, you know, of, of the Slovakia suffering, because they were like, well, shoot, look how many people you lost. We lost a hundred times as many as that. So you'll still, you'll still find, I don't see it so much, but I have seen, I, I, you still can regularly find red stars still up in Eastern um, Slovakia, especially in, in some of the graves, the local uh, graveyards where there might've been a soldier buried. So anything that was Russian was considered pretty high regard. Other questions? Uh, yeah, there's a, uh, someone asked a question. Is there a book that you would recommend uh, to read regarding the, the Dukla Pass campaign and also the S&P revolt? Is there a good English uh, book out there people can, can find? I know there's good English books on the S&P out there. I don't know what they are. I just, I've never really studied the battle enough to have read that many books to be able to recommend one. Dukla is a hard nut to crack. There are a there is a lot of stuff written in Russian and in Slovak, a lot. Um, and I have many of those books, and some of them are very very good books. Uh, but they were printed in the '60s and in the '70s. I've seen nothing come out since then that's English language based. I think that's one of the reasons why a talk like this becomes so popular is because there's nothing English out there anywhere about it. And even looking through the military history, I mean, the way I put this presentation together was it, it felt like I was picking from a, a hundred different books to get all the information in one place. If I wanted to, and I don't, <laughs> You know, a book needs to be written uh, about this. I can, if you go to my website, you will find a lot of references there. Um, my website, uh, the information about Dukla is not just a book of lists. It's not just a website of lists, but I actually go in and explain what's in this book and what it's good for and why you might want to look at it or not look at it. And, you know, a couple pages here or there about things. Um, so much of that history is, is really fading away quickly. So take a look at my website, uh, go to the military section and you'll find a, a, a section on Dukla. And there are many pages of references in there. I just, uh, the top of my head, I just cannot think of one in particular that really tells the story. It's every single book I've read has an ax to grind. It's either from the Russian perspective, it's from the Slovak perspective, it's from the, the German perspective. And you only hear half the story. You know. So it would be good. It would be good. There was a, there was a fella named David Glantz who was, a, um, he worked for the US Military Academy. He was a professor there for, he's a colonel. And uh, he retired recently, but he started writing a series of books called The Unknown Battles of World War II. And he almost got to Tukla Pass. And I've talked with him about this. It's like, when are you gonna do this? And he, he's like, I've got too many other interesting things I wanna write about first. But he has a whole series of books that you still can buy. It's, uh, he's got his own website now called davidglantz.com, G-L-A-N-T-Z. And that's, it's referenced in my website as well. Um, and you're gonna find out about all sorts of Eastern battles that you had no idea went on. Um, 
and, and how it left the country afterwards. I have uh, memoirs. I have a, a Russian memoir from Konev and one from Moskalenko written in Russia. Um, that's a piece of work <laughs> because it's written from, you know, with kind of, you know, communist propaganda in mind. So you have to be wary of the adjectives that they use, you know. It was a glorious army <laughs> with the magnificent soldiers and the brave men. <laughs> kind of goes on like that. So if I can think of anything, I will, but I, I don't. And I guess that's probably one of the reasons why I've given this presentation so many times. All right, let me see if there's any more uh, questions here in the, in the Q&A here. Um, so I, so I, the one person asked about, I guess, uh, about the area, I guess, around the, I'm presuming it's where the, uh, I guess that big tank battle was. Um, that, you know, is it, was it, it was, it was a rural, I mean, it was a, not a very, uh, I mean, yes, there were villages, but it wasn't a very densely populated region. Is, is that correct? Or? It, it's true. Uh, they yeah. were, uh, I can speak a lot to it because um, I learned a lot about, they're all very similar. They were all owned by a similar a uh, landowner off the Umena estate. And uh, the idea was that you built your villages. They're actually more like hamlets, frankly. They're, they only hold like three or 400 people. And, and some of them, maybe 800 people tops. Um, and each of them was so small that even today, administratively, there is a larger town somewhere down the river kind of administers for them. And even the churches don't have priests. They like one priest is in charge of two or three churches. And so you have a, a river coming down and you, you can just, you can follow them like the fingers along the way. They were built um, for two purposes uh, when they went to col colonize the land. And, and it was really after the final invasions and probably occurred around 1600, 15, 1600, when they finally became settled after the Tartars stopped uh, pillaging the place. Um, it was mostly um, uh, wood. They were harvesting wood or they were um, raising sheep for the most part. It wasn't big on growing crops. Um, they ate an awful lot of cabbage and potatoes because that's about all the land could produce. Um, I'm surprised that my grandparents just weren't sick of it and didn't want to make it anymore, but because it is plain, really, if you think mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Um, up until probably the 50s, illiteracy was so high. Illiteracy is still amazingly high. In the mountains themselves, you better be able to speak Rusin because there are people there that are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s that don't speak Slovak. You know, every country has a national language. You know, all your documents are written in Slovak or English and, you know, your certificates and laws and everything. Well, these people, they don't know Slovak. They might know Russian because that was a prescribed a mandatory subject to learn in school if the, if they went to school, and an awful lot of the uh, the kids stop um, going to school at fourth grade. Even yeah, you'd see that with people my age, basically anybody that that's younger than sixty five probably had a better education uh, than these people. So when I went there twenty years ago, I felt like I was stepping back fifty years. I honestly felt that way. And these people had never even left the country in their lives. So they had no idea. This is all they knew. So for a battle going through with them, it was totally an abstraction to them. Which also explains why so many times when you're trying to do your genealogy and you find that they wrote one country, 
They wrote Austria Hungary on one, they wrote Hungary on another, they put Austria on another. They didn't know what country they lived in. <laughs> they didn't care, really. It was only, they only knew it because somebody else cared. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. it looks like uh, that's all the questions we have in our Q&A, Bill. So, um, so I'd like to thank you for uh, coming on today and, and giving what? us this great presentation. And, uh, and I'd like to let all the people who are uh, signed up to watch this, uh, we'll be making a video available of this presentation very soon. And uh, we'll be sending out an email to you when it is available. And you, we encourage you to share it to, uh, with all your friends. And, uh, <clears throat> and also too, uh, keep in mind, or just keep marking your calendar, uh, next Saturday, we're going to have a, a talk with uh, John Rigetti on coal mine culture. So uh, look out for uh, notices from that. It'll probably be starting at, uh, at, at 2 on s next Saturday. So, but more, diesel, more details will be coming out uh, about how to, how to see that. So anyway, thanks, Bill, for coming on today. And thanks, everyone, for, uh, for tuning in. So enjoy your weekend, folks. Thank you. Bye-bye.